Are you ready to tackle Paul's Midrash in his letter to the Galatians? This is podcast number 11. And let me start by just reviewing what we've already done. In Paul's search of the scriptures, he uses ancient methods of legal Midrash to unveil two discoveries from scripture. First is an explanation of how God is fulfilling his promise to Abraham that all the Gentiles shall be blessed in you. Second, we will consider in a future podcast how Paul used legal Midrash to explain how God has honored his promise of the Spirit. Let's take a look now at the structure of Paul's first argument that is answering the question how God is fulfilling his promise to bless the Gentiles. It seems clear that Paul is presenting some kind of argument because of words that convey a conclusion, and therefore introduce two related concluding statements. The building blocks of Paul's reasoning, which lead to the resolution of his argument, are two citations from the Hebrew scriptures. I'm now going to give you my translation, which will identify the citations. When I read it, I'm going to raise my voice when I come to the citations. And then I'm going to continue to offer my translation in order to clarify the Midrash. So what we get In Galatians 3, 6 to 9, we got a citation followed by a conclusion, then a citation followed by a conclusion. All right, let me read citation number one. Just as Abraham believed God and it was credit to him as righteousness. That's Paul citing Genesis 15, 6. Now, what's the conclusion? These are Paul's words. So, meaning consequently, you know that the ones of faith, these very ones are the sons of Abraham. Okay, now we get a second citation. And, it, and that doesn't come till the very end. So we're going to get Paul's words here at the beginning. And the scripture, having foreseen that God is now justifying the nations by faith, is proclaiming the good news in advance to Abraham that all the nations will be blessed in you. Abraham. That's citing Genesis 12, 3. The conclusion, Paul's words, therefore, which is the result, the ones of faith are blessed together with Abraham's faith. Now, let us begin by making preliminary observations about the pattern. Paul cites a verse from the Hebrew scriptures and follows it with a conclusion. He does this twice. So, If we look again at the two conclusions, they're almost identical. Okay, let me read the two conclusions. So, you know that the ones of faith, these very ones, are sons of Abraham. And the second conclusion, therefore, the ones of faith are blessed together with Abraham. Okay, they're almost identical. And then we look at the two citations. Now, what's important about the two citations In the first one, Paul has selected God's promise about the Gentiles that he made to Abraham. Then, when Paul cites a second verse about Abraham, there's going to be a relationship between the two citations. That's the halakhic or legal midrash. You have to get two citations that are are legally and conceptually similar. So, the second citation, which is, is similar, is all the nations will be blessed in you, Abraham. So, the first one Um, Abraham believed God. It was credited to him as righteousness. The second one, all the nations will be blessed in you, Abraham. Certainly, we can see that both citations are about Abraham. But there must be something more that connects these two verses and makes them legally and conceptually similar in order to generate a legal conclusion that Paul declares twice. Furthermore, we note that the concluding statements, which are similar— form a common Hebrew parallel construction for Paul's conclusion. So the conclusions are in parallel. The first conclusion, you know that the ones of faith are sons of Abraham. The second conclusion, the ones of faith are blessed together with Abraham's faith. They're they're in parallel. They're, They're similar. And the two citations are not, they're not the same, but there's a relationship between them, okay? And another feature in the structure of Paul's argument that catches our attention. There was a strange element in the very center. And the center is where I started to read the second citation. There's a whole lot that Paul is talking about. 
The scripture, having foreseen that God is now justifying the nations by faith, is proclaiming good news to Abraham. That has nothing to do with the citation. It's something that's kind of put there in the middle by Paul. They're Paul's words. It's a kind of chiastic focus. With our maturing Hebraic minds, we remember that a startling insertion may offer a clue to the Midrash. Paul has inserted between the two citations and conclusions what appears to be another reference to Scripture. The Scripture having foreseen that God is now justifying the nations, which is the Gentiles by faith. But wait a minute. We know that Scripture prophesies that God will bless the Gentiles through Abraham which is evident in the plain words of Scripture in Genesis 12, 3. And God blessed Abraham by perceiving him as righteous because he believed God. But where in Scripture do we find the promise that God will justify the nations by faith? It is not in Scripture. Yet Paul claims that Scripture foresaw it. Why did he introduce this element of faith as something the scripture foresaw? And how does faith function in the argument? The key that unlocks what Paul is doing in these four verses is his method of Midrash that draws new meaning from scripture. The new understanding is located in two concluding statements that emanate from two building blocks of scripture that are different, but they're related, the the quotations. Then Paul claims in the middle that scripture foresaw faith as the instrument of God's justification. But there's no explicit verse to convey this concept. Finally, we note that the two concluding statements are in a parallel construction. We've identified an artistic pattern in Paul's reasoning, but we need to understand more about legal midrash and how it operates. So all we've seen is citation, conclusion, Something about God's foreseeing, justifying the nations by faith, which is not in Scripture. And then we get a citation and a conclusion again. Now, this study finds in the work of Menachem alone a clear and concise description of 15 canons or methods of legal interpretation of Scripture that alone believes were in use at the time of Paul. I actually met Menachem in in Jerusalem, which was was an, an incredible experience for me. He then requested that I caution my readers that his expertise is Jewish law, the biblical Talmudic and post-Talmudic periods. He he was nervous. He he really didn't want to be seen as identifying with my conclusion that had to do with with Christ, (laughs) the Apostle Paul and Christ. I was very careful to follow that. However, his explanation of ancient methods of legal midrash has been invaluable to my understanding of Paul's legal midrash. So I'm not saying that Uh, Menachem agreed with me, it took him by surprise to see Paul's Midrash in the New Testament. And he was nervous about it and wasn't ready yet to put his name on it. And so at his request, I am assuming full responsibility for applying these historical methods of first century legal reasoning to Paul's argument in Galatians. Since the works of Hillel, which was before Paul, and Rabbi Yishmael, who was after Paul, they're no longer extant. We read about them in the Talmud, but the actual writings of Hillel and Yishmael are no longer available. But we can read about them in the Talmud. So this study draws on the later descriptions in the Talmud, which Elon explains. I couldn't have done it without Elon's description in his books. Elon observes that neither of the two sages, Hillel or Rabbi Yishmael, originated their rules of interpretation. Instead, they simply crystallized customary legal methods of argument already in use and grouped them together. This custom of using methods of Midrash would undoubtedly have continued after the time of Hillel and Rabbi Yishmael into the Talmudic period. This study contends that if these methods of interpretation are evident in the works of Paul, then one can reasonably conclude that Paul was familiar with them. In addition to Hillel's original seven rules of legal reasoning, which Rabbi Yishmael expanded to 13, Elon believes that two other methods of interpretation were also in use during the first century, thus making 15 methods of legal reasoning with which Paul would likely have been familiar. One additional method to Rabbi Yishmael's Yishmael's 13 was an analogical approach that became the predominant manner of Midrash in the centuries following 
Rabbi Yishmael, which we can observe in the Talmud. Now, analogical means to compare two things together. And we saw Paul taking two citations that were legally and conceptually similar. So he's able to compare them because they're legally and conceptually similar. And this is a method of Midrash that we see in the Talmud, and it's very common in the Talmud, actually. And my conclusion is that Paul was using this particular method. The other was a method of logical interpretation also evident in the Talmud. I have concluded from Elon's careful description of these 15 methods of legal Midrash that Paul was using this additional analogical approach in Galatians 3, 6 to 9. Now he's going to use the other one when we get to the next Midrash about curse of the law. This additional analogical method of Hebraic reasoning involves three basic steps. First, it identifies two verses in the Hebrew scriptures that are legally and conceptually similar, often connected by a common word or phrase, which we've just seen. Second, the subject of the first verse is applied to the second in a reciprocal analogy. Reciprocal means to go back and forth between the two in a comparison. An analogy is a form of comparison that transfers information from one source to another through a reciprocal relationship based on similarity. Third, from the reciprocal analogy, one draws a deduction. Now, this, this is really important. Um, because what we read in that chiastic center was the deduction. A deduction is a form of conclusion, but it's a conclusion that is required to understand the, the analogy. The deduction uncovers a hidden meaning from Scripture. The resulting meaning, sometimes called a law, solves a problem that stems from a practical situation for which Scripture has no explicit answer. Now, let's read the deduction again. The deduction is this. Scripture, having foreseen which he did not do in literal words, but through the Midrash drawing out the meaning, that God is justifying the nations by faith. All right, that's the deduction. And it's in the middle. It's in the middle, which is not the way we do it. We would do it at the very end. And it allows Paul to draw the two conclusions. It's Hebraic logic. It's very different from the way we think, which is hard for us to understand. And it took Elon's books for me to be able to figure it out. Now, let's look more carefully at the three steps. First, Paul identifies two verses from Scripture that are legally and conceptually similar. So Abraham believed God. It was credited to him as righteousness. And then all the nations will be blessed in Abraham. Both verses are about Abraham, so the relationship between the two verses demonstrates legal and conceptual similarity. But there's more. In the first citation, we see the righteousness of Abraham, a blessing that God bestowed on him because of his faith in God's promise of a son not yet born to Abraham and Sarah. So it was not his faith in the Messiah. It was faith in God's promise. And God's promise was that he would have a son that would be born to Abraham and Sarah. In the second citation, God promised a blessing to the Gentiles. So it's another promise. God promised a blessing to the Gentiles through Abraham. We find that the two verses not only have Abraham in common, but they also involve God's blessing. In the case of Abraham in the first verse, the subject is the blessing of righteousness to Abraham because he believed God's promise of a son. In the second verse, God has promised to bless the nations, the Gentiles, through Abraham. Paul applied the subject of the first verse, which was God's blessing of righteousness to Abraham, in a reciprocal going back and forth comparison analogy to the second verse, God will bless the nations through Abraham. From this reciprocal analogy, Paul could deduce, that's what's in that middle chiastic construction, that scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, just like Abraham. That scripture foresaw this event does not point to any specific verse or passage in the Hebrew scriptures. Instead, because the two verses Paul cited are legally and conceptually similar, the analogy allows an interaction between if God blessed Abraham by bestowing righteousness on him because he believed in God's promise, then the blessing of the Gentiles through Abraham must also involve God's bestowing righteousness on them because of, of their faith in believing God's promise. From this reciprocal analogy, Paul can draw a logical deduction. 
God would justify the Gentiles by faith. The scripture does not foresee this matter in any explicit verse, but offers enough evidence in two verses that are legally and conceptually similar so Paul could draw out hidden meaning by making a deduction from analogy. The purpose of the analogy, explains Elon, my wonderful instructor, is an expansive interpretation of scripture that uncovers a new legal principle. Paul declares the new law twice. Following the first citation, and this is what follows the first citation, so you know that the ones of faith, these are, are descendants of Abraham. And then following the second citation, here's the conclusion. Therefore, the ones of faith are blessed together with Abraham's faith. Both declarations of the new law include the phrase, the ones of faith. In the context of Paul's argument, these ones of faith are Gentiles of the nations, since Scripture declares the prophecy in uh, Genesis, all the Gentiles shall be blessed in you, Abraham. The new law that Paul has uncovered from Scripture explains how God has justified the Gentiles. By their faith, the Gentiles become seed, that is, descendants of Abraham, thus inheriting the same blessing that Abraham received from God. As God bestowed the blessing of righteousness on Abraham, who believed God's promise, and the blessing also not on Abraham, but also on his physical descendants, who will inherit Abraham's blessing, so God now bestows righteousness to the Gentiles who believe as Abraham believed. They are now Abraham's descendants, not physical offspring, as the Jews are physical descendants of Abraham, but descendants nevertheless by their believing as Abraham believed. From the standpoint of the first century Jewish environment in which Paul lived, his conclusions would have been startling and dramatic. And he's pulled out new understanding from Scripture. The analogical analysis of Scripture was never a purely theological exercise, which, you know, theology draws conclusions that become doctrine, and unfortunately, eventually, many become dogma. So that's not the purpose of this Jewish exercise of Midrash, nor was its initial purpose to form or establish doctrine or laws. Instead, legal Midrash, now listen carefully, was generally a response to some situation that called for an explanation and a practical application from Scripture. You remember, Scripture says to do no work on the Sabbath. Well, what happens if your ox falls into the pit and is going to die? So the oral law expanded on what was in the Hebrew Scriptures to come up with new understanding, which they call laws. And that's what Paul is doing here. He's uncovering new understanding, which you can call a law if you want. The Jews don't call it because they don't believe in the New Testament, unless they're Jewish Christians. This practical application is, is what the Midrash is all about. And you remember in Galatians 3.1, Paul introduced his rhetorical questions <laughs> by saying, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It's the Jewish Christians who were teaching them that they had to know the law and be circumcised. Jewish believers in Galatia thought that traditional rituals for entrance and participation in the covenant community, which was circumcision, study of the law, and rules of purity, were God's requirements for his people, the Jews, and therefore should be requirements for these gentle believers who had to become Jews. That's what they were teaching. But Paul's legal midrash was answering three important questions. First, if Paul does not bring the Gentiles into his covenant relationship by their physical descent from Abraham, with fleshly circumcision as a sign of that covenant, and study of the law as the guide to a life that pleases God, then how do the Gentiles enter the covenant relationship with God? Now that has just been explained. Now the next question will be answered in the next Midrash that we will do in the next podcast. Second, what is the sign, if not circumcision, that God has accepted them in these Gentiles into a covenant relationship with him? And finally, how do these Gentile believers walk in a righteous way, if not by learning the law? So that's going to come in the next Midrashic argument that ends with something about curse of the law which is not a curse of the law. <laughs> it has something to do with Paul's Midrashic ar argument. So Paul's analogical interpretation that we've just seen in Galatians 3, 6 to 9 
Now leads us to more puzzling questions. Scripture reveals that Abraham's faith was in God's promise of a son not yet born to Abraham and Sarah. But what is the object of the Gentiles' faith? This is all going to come in the next podcast. And how does God justify the Gentiles by that faith? Furthermore, after receiving God's blessing of righteousness, how does faith operate to aid the believer to live in a way that pleases God? Paul will answer these questions in a continuing legal interpretation from Scripture. So, um, the next podcast will examine Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 to 13, from the perspective of Paul's Hebraic legal reasoning, and will explore Paul's final breathtaking conclusion in Galatians 3, 14. We will see that Paul has discovered from Scripture not only how the ones of faith have received God's promise of the Spirit, but also, and this is so important for us today, how the power of that Spirit operates through faith. So I look forward to working with you in the next podcast. And if you want to go over this again, um, I remind you that it, it's in the law is not a curse, Paul's Midrash in Galatians, which is my book that you can find on Amazon. And the book explains more than I'm doing. I'm trying to kind of boil it down and making it as simple as possible for you. But if you really want to get more advanced, you can you can go to the book. I look forward to seeing you in the next podcast.